Now, often with this, with this settlement pattern, these different settlement patterns, um, of course you would see violence break out in North America between the English and the Amerindians and the French. And this, this was a, an, a, I don't want to say a common or frequent, but this was a regular and uh, not unexpected occurrence. And sometimes there would be fighting in Europe, like with the Nine Years' War in the 17th century, which would spill over into the colonies in North America, and that was called King William's War in North America. And the, the Amerindians especially inhabited this kind of nebulous middle ground is the term the historians use to try to negotiate between the English and the French. And a way to help your students understand kind of what the middle ground is, is if you get three, three of your students and you get a circle of, of string or rope and have each student hold on to a piece of that and kind of lean back. And so you kind of have this very delicate balance. And if someone shifts their weight, everyone has to shift their weight. Because the Amerindians are, of course, using the fact that there are two Mm, two groups of people who don't always get along, the, the French and the English. T the Amerindians are taking advantage of this to kind of play one off the other at times. And so everyone, of course, has their own interests at heart. But you have this really interesting, you know, kind of three-pronged balance here. And, of course, violence is going to break out from time to time. Now, violence breaks out as kind of a prelude to the Seven Years' War in 1754 with Jumonville's Glen. And... Um, the Seven Years' War doesn't begin with Jumonville's Glen, because remember, the Seven Years' War is a world war. And it really begins in 1756 with the Battle of Minorca, which is, in the, which is a large naval battle, and it takes place in the Mediterranean. But you see some of the initial violence in North America that's going to kind of be a prelude to this war with Jumonville's Glen. And Jumonville's Glen is a wonderful story that I think your students would appreciate. Uh, and, and it features a, a very young man. A very young Anglo-American man. He was he was raised in America, but he loves England, and he he's, he's working for the English government, and he's working in the in the um, in the, the English army as a as a provincial officer, and he is given the task of going into Western Pennsylvania with some of his troops and some Amerindian allies that he has, and he is given the task of looking to see where exactly the French are, and he is allowed to use violence if he sees the French encroaching on English territory or disrupting English trade because the English were very afraid that with the French so deep in North America, they were going to disrupt English trade with uh, Amerindians and others. And so, so this young man takes his, takes his troops, and he takes his Amerindian allies, and he goes through, and he uh, uh, you know, is, is, is looking for the French, and he's kind of aware that there's a French group kind of following him and tracing him, and he thinks, aha, rather than be ambushed by these French people who are following me, I will ambush them first. And so early one morning, this, this young man and his, and his, uh, and his troops and his, uh, and his Amerindian allies, they, they creep up and they find the French and they open fire and they kill many French people and the whole time there's a man waving a white piece of paper at him. And so finally the officer calms everybody down to look at this white piece of paper and this young man is an Anglo-American. He doesn't understand any French. And of course the letter is in French and of course the person trying to hand it to him is French. And the person who's trying to hand it to him, by the way, is a, is a French man named Jumonville. Jumonville. And so while this, while this young man is trying to read the letter, one of his Amerindian allies takes a tomahawk, splits the head of Jumonville, and then starts to ritually wash his hands in the dead man's brains. This is a wonderful story. So the Anglo-American officer it panics a little bit. He takes the message, which essentially is a message of peace, saying, we want to know what you're doing here. What are you doing here creeping around? Um, and he starts, he starts to head back back to the east. And of course he's being, he's being followed because now he's done horrible violence against the French. Now he's being followed by a man named Villiers, who is Jumonville's brother, who is of course seeking revenge. And this man is, is, is running with his, what's left of his troops and left of his Amerindian allies. It's pouring rain. He's not making much progress. He knows he's going to have to make a stand because the French are encroaching on, on him. So he stops and he builds a fort out of pure necessity and he names the fort Fort Necessity. And after, after some time of fighting with his, with his enemies, he finally says, I have to surrender to the French. There's no way I can make a stand anymore. And so Villiers approaches this young officer, and he, he presents him with essentially a surrender treaty, and he has, which he has to sign. And the surrender treaty seems to be pretty generous because he's allowed to keep his life, he can keep his troops, he only has to give over two hostages, and he can return to his commander. And so he, this, 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 um, the surrender treaty is in French. The Anglo-American still does not read French, but he signs his name to it and goes on his way. What the poor man does not realize is that when he signed his name, he signed a full confession to the murder of Jumonville, 
which, since this is a little skirmish that happened in the backwoods of western Pennsylvania, might not seem like such a big deal, but it set off a huge diplomatic catastrophe as people back in France reacted very violently to the idea that their men in North America are being murdered in cruel and harsh ways by the English barbarians. And it puts a lot of patriotic fuel into France. And if, if you can imagine that, there's, a, there's an American song um, that's very popular on the radio now, and it's, it's, it says, you know, if you attack us, we'll stick a boot in your ass. It's the American way. That's kind of the French reaction to, to, to the massacre of Jumonville. Now, what makes this even more interesting, and, and, and this, of course, stokes the fires for war. Even though war has not broken out yet, it won't break out for another two years. But there's already violence in North America over tensions between the British and the French and, of course, various Amerindian nations who are trying to negotiate their way between them. Now, the name of this Anglo-American officer who took full credit for the murder of Jumonville's Glen was George Washington. And yes, the very same George Washington that was going to eventually be general of the American forces during the American Revolution and our first president, and many consider him to be the best president of all time and one of our national myths and our great man, and you can go to Mount Vernon and buy lollipops that feature his head on it and all kinds of wonderful things. But just keep this in mind with your students that if you have a bad day or if your first job doesn't go the way it's supposed to, George Washington had his bad days when he was a young man too. And his bad day was really, really bad because not only was a man uh, uh, killed under, um, un under his guard, uh, unjustly killed under his guard, but he actually started off this huge diplomatic brouhaha um, for the, for that, that, that contributed to, to the Seven Years' War getting started.